a Veterans History Project interview. I am Frances Westbrook, and I'd like to introduce our guests. So would you please give us your names? My name is Myrtle Connolly, and I'm glad to be here. And I don't know how much good I'll be, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Evelyn Connolly, her daughter. Good. And I'm going to also participate. Evelyn, would you tell us how, how it is you happen to be here and what you're going to share with us? I happen to be here because I remember a gentleman that I, and his family that we have known for 60 plus years. He was an employee of the Coca-Cola Company and along with several other gentlemen, he went and he was made a part of a World War II U.S. Army effort to make sure the troops were provisioned and enjoyed Coca-Cola during World War II. His uh, particular area was to go out to um, serve the troops. I'm going to share with you a dictation that Mr. Charles C. Pierce gave to his grandson a few years ago talking about his years in the with the uh, Army and the Coca-Cola Company during World War II. Soon after General Dwight Eisenhower arrived in Europe in command of all troops, he requested his chief of staff to make arrangements for refreshments for the troops. Mr. Robert Woodruff responded at once and promised that the Coca-Cola Company would take on the project. Mr. Woodruff set up a special fund of $7 million and the Coca-Cola Sales Company was formed to handle this along with the Coca-Cola Export Corporation. Mr. James Curtis, president of Coca-Cola Export, was responsible for finding personnel and equipment. Bottling equipment was almost non-existent. A team of engineers set out in search of all available equipment. Many pieces required were found in salvage yards and brought to Long Island City, New York. One rebuilt bottling line may include parts from several other lines. These were shipped to North Africa, England, France, and later to Germany after May of 1945. Coca-Cola engineers, along with engineers from Liquid Carbonic and Hessman Ligonier companies, developed a portable dispensing unit called the Jungle Dispenser Junior Dole Dispenser. It was a water tank with a rocker set up to mix CO2 gas for carbonated water, plus an ice making machine which could make 12, 25 pound blocks of ice in 12 hours. Both units were mounted on 8 by 10 skids that could be towed by Jeep or any other vehicle or lifted on an Army 6 by 6 truck. Most of the jungle units were sent to the South Pacific. A couple of Fountain Division men went to the Philippines to help install the units and teach Army personnel how to operate them. One of our men was with the invasion force in the Philippines and with the group of GIs forced to hold out at Bagao, north of Manila, in the coastal mountain caves. I was in the second group re recruited by export to go overseas. I was a Fountain Division sales representative in New York and eligible for the draft. I had to de obtain a deferment from Washington, D.C. Draft Board. It took a couple of weeks to do that, including a visit to the draft board. They granted the deferment when they realized I was going to the war zone and would be working with Army Exchange Service, supplying Coca-Cola to the troops. My first trip was to St. Louis to familiarize myself with the jungle unit and the ice maker, then to Army stores for uniforms and for uh, shots which were necessary before leaving the United States. Leaving my family and three-year-old daughter and nine-month-old son was no fun, but since many other Army, Navy, and Marines were in the same boat, this seemed 
to me a way to help those who are fighting. On May the 10th, I left New York for San Francisco. Then May 16th, I left for um, the Pacific aboard the Navy ship SS Marine Serpent with 650 GIs and approximately 50 officers and me, a civilian. I traveled with an assimilated rank of major, though I was still a civilian. My classification was TO, or Technical Observer with Officer Status. We zigzagged across the Pacific for 17 days. We arrived in Hollandia, New Guinea at the end of May, and then on to an army base of 3,500 GIs plus 1,800 WACs. Living was in six to eight people tents. The mess hall was a large Quonset hut with outdoor recreation area and theater. My first job was to check all jungle units in the area, including air base, hospital, and service outlying engineering groups, and six to eight outfits in an area 10 to 40 miles out of Hollandia. The weather was extremely hot and very humid, with rain every day for a couple of hours. Then all roads dried out to about four to six inches of dust. The food was regular army, plenty of it, but not deluxe, but it sustained us. I spent one month in New Guinea, then moved to the Philippines aboard a tramp steamer, which meant seven days at sea. July 4th, I arrived in Manila. Here I found the San Miguel Brewery not operating. Coca-Cola bottling equipment was being installed in the brewery garage. I located two other fountain representatives and moved in with them. The second floor of the auto sales company and shop, which was the bedroom for 150 army officers and 15 civilians and three Coca-Cola reps. The mess hall for this group was the first floor. Showers and the washroom were in the next building. Um, nothing fancy, but better than most of the troops had. We had many jungle units in, Manila, in the Manila area, also at Clark Field, the big air base and Navy Command Center, which was in Manila, along with the 8th Army Headquarters. Here, we in the Fountain Division had a full schedule each day, keeping our jungle units in operation and repair. The repair shop was set up near a warehouse in order that we might keep in touch with all units in the area. I made a number of visits to Clark Field to oversee the repair of their units and supply new dispenser valves, etc. We installed a complete fountain setup at the Navy Headquarters Officers Club. The club was open from 5 to 7 each evening for snacks and 30 cents for a shot for alcoholic drinks. I was at the P.O. Depot when the American and English prisoners were released from San Tomas, the Japanese prison. These men were walking and crawling skeletons. Some of these men had lost as much as 100 pounds while in the prison. On August the 20th, the war ended, and a week later, one of our engineers and I were transferred to Japan. We joined approximately 5,000 troops and 250 officers aboard some 12 ships and proceeded to Japan. The usual trip was six to seven days, but a typhoon caught us and we spent some 12 days on a very rough Pacific trip. We landed in Yokohama on September the 9th. The city had been firebombed quite a mess, except the downtown area about one mile long and a half mile wide. We were quarter, quartered in the recreation hall of the city sport complex. Approximately 150 men slept on cots approximately three feet apart. The gentleman and I had trouble making arrangements for our own transportation for a week. After hitchhiking to Tokyo, we were able to obtain transportation, which was a weapons carrier and driver who were assigned to me, but had to be turned in each night. 
This hampered our travel since many of our army units were 50 to 75 miles away and we were not permitted out on the country roads after dark. Our driver had to be in for evening roll call. Finally, I was able to purchase a Jeep. The barter system always works. We found two apartments for three of us. No beds, but slept Japanese style on mats on the floor. After a month of this, we found a house. The German vice council had to vacate his home and we were able to get it. We now had two Jeeps and several more men in Yokohama who were waiting for bottling plants to arrive in Japan. Two of our engineers found a location for the CO2 plant, a Japanese Zero Fighters plane factory in Yokosuka, a suburb of Yokohama on Tokyo Bay. The Army Exchange Service decided to use the extra warehouse space we had for all of the exchange equipment, which included jungle units and drums of syrup that had been made by the Army Exchange Service from the Philippines. A triple Dixie bottling plant was installed in Tokyo, but it produced about 150 cases per hour, so we had to operate two shifts six days a week. No way could we keep up with the demand. Later, a second bottling line came in. This was installed in a textile plant in Yokohama. With this unit, we were able to meet the demand of 375 cases per hour using two shifts, six days per week. My duties increased as I traveled to Sapporo, the main city on Hokkaido, the North Island. On this trip, we installed a new style fountain unit. We had five units in Japan and the others were in the Philippines. I traveled to Fukuoka on the south island of Kiyushi. On this visit, we visited Hiroshima, the H-bomb city and port of Kitakushka, very near it to Nagasaki, the second city to be bombed. For those who are knowledgeable of Japanese, please excuse my pronunciation. For my last months in Japan, I was in Kobe at our bottling plant. I worked as an outside representative for all military units in the Kobe, Osaka, Nagoya area. Our Air Force did not bomb these cities as they did around Tokyo, Yokohama. They pinpointed most areas of industrial value, not so much residential. Since I was the only experienced fountain man who covered all of Japan from Hokkaido north, Honshu Main Island and Kyushu South Island of Shikoko was not occupied. It was the main fishing port of Japan. I spent ten, 10 months in Japan, but put 21,000 miles on a Jeep and another 1,000 miles I traveled by rail. I visited more than 200 army units, including many hospitals. We installed and repaired approximately 150 Coca-Cola units, namely the jungle units. One of the most interesting service calls was aboard the battleship Iowa, the sister ship to the Missouri. General MacArthur and the Japanese signed the surrender papers on the Missouri, August 20th, 1945. I came back to the United States on July 1946 after four months in New Guinea and the Philippines and ten months in Japan. My nine-month-old son, at the time I left the States, was now two years old. He looked upon me as a stranger in the house. Extremely interesting. This, this ends Mr. Charles C. Pierce's period of service to the Coca-Cola Company at that time. In New York. And could you please tell me now how you came to have this and what is the connection with you and your I came to have this because Mrs. Pierce, his widow, had shared it with me uh, Two years, two or three years ago, when Mr. Pierce died, I've no, my mother and father and I have known Mr. Pierce uh, for we knew them from the time I was three years old, 63 years ago. 
Mr. Pierce, Mr. Pierce was originally hired by a gentleman, and he was assigned to work in my father's area for his first employment with the Coca-Cola company as a sales representative in Manhattan. My father's district at the time in New York it was in Lower Manhattan. I see. So the Coca-Cola connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you want to turn us off for the moment? <laughs> <laughs> As a continuation of our present our presentation or input to this project, we thought we would share some things that we experienced in during, our, the, war. during the war in our own home life. And we we're talking about rationing in ter with both food and gasoline. Also, as it relates to my father's experience with the Coca-Cola company, sugar, sugar was rationed and making, getting, enjoying Coca-Cola and as a, on the home front or the domestic area, a bit more uh, special occasion to enjoy Coca-Cola because of it being naturally processed with natural sugar many years ago. Um, there we, I can remember a number of times that due to rationing, I would in, be enjoy, be, be given, call it what you will, spam, which mom had made into sandwiches, <laughs> which I would in, come home and have at lunch. In those days, young ladies and boys, what, when they went to school, they had to walk back and forth because of gas rationing. Growing up in the New York area, since the gas was rationed, the only times we would get to ride in a car to go to school was uh, during snowy, icy periods or heavy rains. Otherwise, we walked. In another time we also experienced air raid drills with the wardens in each city and community were there were wardens that uh, would alert the native the uh, folks at home to possible air raids one particular evening my mother was at the hospital with me when I had my tonsils removed at the age of about five. And a friend of ours was having a poker party at his home. And my mother knew at, from the hospital staff that there would be a pre, an air raid drill. So she quietly called our friends up and told them to be sure to have their black shades drawn because of the air raid drill that would take place. Is that about, am I telling it the way it was? That is, is right, and they wanted to know how did we get the information. And, and uh, was it Je he said, Joey oh. said, uh, he turned to his wife and he said, what was Merle doing in the hospital? She said, oh, she was visiting her daughter who had <laughs> tons tonsils, yeah. And, uh, it was a lot, a lot of funny little things went along with uh, rationing and the air raids and all of that. One reminiscence that I had a little while ago while we were getting our thoughts together to do this was some of the news that Walter Winchell would share with families. Or, and I can remember on a couple of occasions being at that impressionable age where his particular voice quality plus some of the thoughts he was saying were, uh, it filled me with, uh, uh, made me uh, afraid. Today we would call it anxiety, but in those days uh, you were plumb afraid. <laughs> um, we then get on to another area when back in the about 1942 I would say there were clipper airships that were the early 
airplanes that pa the Pan American uh, airline, airline line company had, and they would land on water. They were not did not have wheels to them, so that they had to both take off on from water as well as land in the water. We lived in an area of Long Island called Jackson Bay Manor, and Flushing Bay was a very short distance from there. And I was well aware when they were taking off because of the noise and the vibrations on takeoff. I could feel it in my bedroom, and it was quite scary to me. My mother would like to uh, share some thoughts about the service of her brothers in Europe. Uh, one was in Italy and another one served in, well, the one in Italy moved up to Germany and he and met his brother who was also serving in England and then moved over to Germany. Mother, you want to comment about? Yeah, well, Bob, but he, he was on, they he put him on a ship and he was going to go to the Philippines and uh, they got sort of halfway there and they turned him up, the ship around and they came back and he was so pleased. One way he went through the uh, canal and the other time he went up through Alaska and he said he saw parts of the world that at that time they'd never seen before. But uh, after he got married, his wife wanted to go to all those places he'd been. <laughs> My mother is uh, sharing with you his trip to the Pacific and the war was just declared over about the time he got through the Panama Canal. So, But uh, before that time, he had left the States on a troop ship in a rather unfortunate weather and he was one of the few people who worked in the galley who did not endure seasickness on this particular <laughs> crossing and he uh, spent most of his tour of duty in um, England as well as Germany behind the lines because his uh, expertise in mechanics he was repaired trucks and kept a lot of helped to keep the uh, trucks and machinery working, whereas mm -hmm. the other brother, George, was uh, went from the tip of Italy and Salerno all the way through the Italian peninsula up mm -hmm. to Germany in his um, work, although he stayed behind the lines most of the time because of his eye problems and the kind of work that he did. I think that pretty much draws it to a conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. This portion of our taping for historical purposes is to bring a, a connection for my mother's and my presentation of the Second World War and our memories of that time plus the other presentation dealing with the gentleman with the Coca-Cola company, to share with you a family background uh, as to why my mother and I are here in the year 2004. My father was born in Atlanta in West End in 1909. He was the third son in a family. My grandparents were Charles Price Connolly Sr. and Toddy Sells Connolly, better known, really known as Phoebe Ann Sells Connolly. They resided on Culberson Street in West End for the duration of their marriage from about 19... Oh, one when they were married till my grandfather's death in 1945 and my grandmother's ultimate death about 1959. My father was born, as I may have mentioned, in 1909. He graduated from high school at Tech High and had attended People's Street School prior to that. 
um, when he graduated from Tech High in 1925, he had a scholarship to Sewanee at the uni in Tennessee at the University of the South. He also was offered a summer job with the Coca-Cola Company at that time. It was decided that it would be better if he were to go to a school inside the state of Georgia because once he graduated from college he would be making his business associates in Georgia. It's an interesting aside is that once he graduated from the university in 1929 he was transferred to Erie, Pennsylvania and from there to um, a couple of other locations and then ultimately to Boston in 1934. But we will leave that aside and continue with a little bit more historical information on my father's life. When he was a young man, my, my, as an, also as an aside, my grandfather was a police officer and during the course of his career he ultimately was made assistant chief of police the year was about the time my father was a freshman at the university, which would have been 1926. Um, during my father's uh, high school career, which turned out to be a good one, one achieve, he achieved his uh, recognition and the scholarship to go to the University of the South at Sewanee because it was awarded to the top graduate of the Tech High School each year. My grandfather had a friend by the name of John Edmondson, who in recent time I have learned was rather an influential gentleman at the state capitol. Um, he had a, Mr. Edmonds, my father was uh, appointed to be a page at the state capitol sometime during his high school career. Regrettably, he's not here to correct me in the timing of this. Um, and Mr. Edmondson was a friend of Mr. Robert Woodruff, who was a very kind and forward-looking person, even in his youth. At the time my father met Mr. Woodruff, which was 19... Um, 25, Mr. Woodruff was 20 years older than my father, having been born in 1889, as many people are aware of. And he had the vision to see that there were many young men who needed the, uh, an assist to go to, to college, to to benefit both uh, the city and the state and the region to help bring this the southeast out of the difficult times it was even experiencing in the early part of our of the 20th century. Um, I better stop now.